Hello and welcome to StressAnxietyHypnosis.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks A very long title Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Now, today's recording is actually a request. So somebody sent me a message on Facebook saying that they enjoy my recordings. And could I make a recording for... I have to remember what I'm doing now. What is it? For hypochondria, or not, that's kind of hypochondria in a sense of the anxiety and the panic that comes with thinking that you may be ill. So I kind of got a few things to say about this. Admittedly, I don't have you know any information about the person that sent the message as far as what they were hoping for me to discuss in this recording because although these sessions aren't it's not formatted in a hypnosis kind of format that you may get elsewhere in fact I'm pretty sure that you won't find probably anyone in the world that does it the way I do it and it doesn't mean that I'm I'm special or anything it's just I just do it differently so I don't do the uh, formal trance or deepener or um, sometimes I do Generally, I kind of think of it like this. you got your unconscious mind, you've got your conscious mind. And I would say that the conscious mind, when the conscious mind is listening, so is the unconscious mind at the same time the unconscious mind is not ignoring it just like your your conscious mind is not ignoring what I'm saying but consciously you may drift off you may have your eyes closed which I do suggest um, only in a sense of so you don't listen to me when you're driving or doing something that you need your attention for but even if you're consciously drifting a bit your mind is still listening and it's still absorbing because if we weren't able to have changes occur by consciously listening if we just relied on being in some kind of uh, hypnotic trance where you're just practically um, zapped out 
then self-help audios, self-help videos, uh, self-development books would be of no use to people. But self-development books really are useful. Life-changing, in fact. Well, any book could be. It only takes one sentence that resonates with you. You know, whether the subject is uh, relationships or this subject that we're talking about now. Just that one sentence, that one paragraph, that that one idea. And my, vo my voice is going croaky for some reason. Hopefully it'll start to go back now, good. So, that's kind of my description of what I do. So I talk about things, talk about ideas, and you can just listen and maybe something will resonate within you, something will change within you. I, do, I also try to discuss my own personal experiences with this subject as well. Also, from experience, I haven't been, I've been doing this a long time now, uh, making recordings, is from the feedback that I've received over the last 13 and a half years of making these recordings, people say that just listening to me actually is relaxing without me even needing to mention the word relax. And I suppose part of that would be the fact that I'm not shouting, because that would be really unrelaxing. But just talking softly discussing gently in a gentle way the subject matter of panic stress anxiety talking about this subject which is a very broad subject and it's very personal for each individual I believe needs to be discussed gently because I don't necessarily think that we're, I say we, but I'm going to say this anyway, it might, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that we are always as gentle with ourselves as we could benefit from being. And what by that I mean just internally the things we say to ourselves the way we respond to ourselves the way we perhaps respond to the outside world perhaps the things we think and the things we expect and our way of observing the world So we're not always particularly kind to ourselves, which I would advise, I would suggest, 
change in that? Would actually change your life by being more gentle with yourself. Change your life. And it's not just the words that you say, it's not just the sentences that you tell yourself, the things that you say to yourself, not just the criticism, the self criticism. It's also maybe the tone of it. The tone, the the energy behind it, the because you can get the feeling your internal response to when you talk to yourself. And I don't mean like having a big full-blown conversation. I only do that with Andre the Ferret. He never talks back. He does squeak a little bit sometimes. But the, the tone of how you speak to yourself internally, that self voice that self criticism that I think we all have to some degree and even and I've been thinking about this lately even which is something I do myself even if it's cloaked in humour my question there is does that make it okay If it's cloaked in humour, does that make it okay? So I put myself down, you know, not just internally, but outwardly to other people. I make fun of my weight. I make fun of my big juicy belly that I got. And the other day someone said that to me. And I didn't like it. And I was walking in the park and a couple of people I know were there and I said, went to say hello and one of them said, oh, have you got Andre under your coat? I said, no. And uh, he kept repeating it. So basically I understood what he meant straight away, but he was just trying to say that my belly looked like I had Andre, my, like my little boy Andre the ferret, underneath my jacket. And I didn't enjoy it, I'll be honest with you. And that was done with humour, or attempted humour. And I do wonder maybe how useful that is if we say stuff to ourselves like that, even in humour. And I'm a big fan of humour. I'm a big fan of, you know, looking at things in a a more light, a light way, looking at things in a humorous way to maybe reduce the stress and anxiety of the event. So it's a great way to do things, but is it cloaking, putting yourself down? Is it hiding the fact that maybe you're not being very kind to yourself? So that's one thing that I kind of was thinking about. So on the subject of hypochondria, 
and there's various different angles to look at this from it's kind of in a sense of anxiety panic you've got hypochondria I mean it, the whole the meaning of the word is to imagine that a person imagines that they're ill when they're not But if you have the extreme anxiety, that is an illness. Extreme stress is an illness. It's not permanent. It may be temporary. It may be really temporary. You know, it might just be for the occasion, just for one occasion. But it might be very debilitating. So, when I was going through the extreme times of anxiety and panic, I think most of my time was spent thinking about panic attacks that was what I was thinking about worrying about when the next one was going to happen worrying about where it was going to happen so did that make me a hypochondriac being worried about something that was going to happen although it didn't have to happen because worrying about it and expecting it to happen made it much more likely to happen comes back to that sentence we become what we think about so is that hypochondria because a lot of people that would be labelled hypochondriacs maybe they need to be labelled or not labelled but maybe they need to be if they're going to have a diagnosis or get some help get help with that stress and that anxiety because maybe with someone labelled as a hypochondriac their anxiety and panic is focused on the worry of being ill or the feeling that they are or have got various different illnesses and there's a very there's a very famous thing um, I say famous but it's well known in the nursing world and doctor world not doctor who but doc, you know doctors and my I've I've dated a few nurses over the years and for some reason I don't know why it just it's just happened and when you become a nurse or as an example it might be other professions as well but when you become a nurse you learn about lots of different illnesses, diseases, conditions, you know, it's like a big amount of knowledge presented to your brain. And it seems to be a natural process that not all, but some trainee nurses and trainee doctors 
would start to think that they had these illnesses, these diseases. So in a sense, learning about all these different conditions caused temporary hypochondria. And then they just move out of it. You know, they move on with the next thing. But it seems to be like a a standard thing that quite a few nurses go through. That's what I've been told. So as it's temporary and I would say that hypochondria is temporary some would say everything is temporary which technically it is it means that it will pass as every panic attack has passed no panic attack lasts sometimes feels like it's lasting forever but it never does eventually it subsides because it's impossible to keep any feeling going continuously no feeling whether it's pain or pleasure can continue constantly the whole time at the same level for just continuously forever can't I've broken a few bones over the years and the difference between but you know when you've broken a bone basically it's because the initial pain stays and I don't mean stays forever but it's still there so if you fall you hurt your hand let's say I fell out of the bath uh, a couple of years back and I broke my wrist now the I knew it was broken because the initial pain didn't subside and when that happens that's a good clue there's a very good chance that it's fractured or broken and you need to get to the doc well to the hospital to the emergency ward and get it checked out But you know what, even when I was in the hospital emergency waiting to be seen, the pain did subside. Not down to the level of that it would do if it was bruised, but it did fluctuate. And trust me, I had nothing else to focus on because a broken bone gives you definitely it's a lot of it gives you a good focus not good focus but it gives you something to definitely focus on but it was just my wrist so it was, it was bearable had it been my leg or something it might have been a different matter but because of my left just my wrist and I could if it had been like a... It's never a straight line. It's always up and down. So above the line, down below the line, above, below. It's changing. Just in a way as stress levels always changing. Sometimes they go a bit too high and you can feel it. But then it subsides again. 
It's always changing, different levels, depending on, I guess, environment, depending on your health. Can you know, depends on what you've had to eat, because you know, if you've had a too many cups of coffee, your adrenaline might be going a bit too much. Your heart might be beating a bit more than normal. So it might be a little bit spiky, a little bit more. But it still never stays at one position. It's always continually going back down again. And rising and going down. Like the ocean, like the, you know, the tide. The waves. Constantly moving. Constantly coming in, going out, coming in, going out. Even when the tide's moving inwards, it still doesn't just, the water doesn't just all come in all at one time. It's gradual. And it's still going out. It's coming in, but it's still going out again. It might come in further, but it's still going out. So in a way, if you think about hypochondria, first of all, I don't think it's a nice label to give yourself because technically I would say that I could definitely have called myself a hypochondriac back then because I really did feel that uh, I was ill you know you know something wrong with me there was times I thought did I have diabetes did I have um, something wrong with my adrenal gland did I you know um, I ended up in the a the emergency ward in hospital at least twice maybe three times with pains in my chest thinking I was having a heart attack and I wasn't and another time I actually really thought that I was going crazy and it's not a word I normally use but especially as I got bipolar but at that time I hadn't been diagnosed with anything other than well I've been diagnosed with anxiety disorder stress, depression, various different things, but I literally thought that my I was going out of my mind. I mean, really genuinely thought that I was losing my mind at one point. And I remember, I remember that night. I'll always remember that night. And I began walking to the hospital about three o'clock in the morning and it was a long walk in fact I didn't even know how to get there from where I lived but I just had to, I was just walking because I had to walk I had to I couldn't just sit still and eventually I calmed down eventually my mind calmed down Maybe the cool air, some oxygen, you know, a bit more fresh air being outside. It was late, so there was no cars, so I didn't, you know, it's probably a bit, the air was probably a bit fresher. But did, did that make me a hypochondriac? Or did it mean that actually I had a condition? An anxiety condition which pains in my chest feeling that I was um, ill was part of that it was part of that and you know what one thing I kind of noticed 
with anxiety and panic is it's easy to start ignoring our bodies and just dismissing everything as being anxiety oh, it's just anxiety it's just panic but we don't know what's going on inside our, inside our body I don't mean this in an alarming way but just in a factual way in a caring for yourself way to just show yourself a bit more respect and concern in a sense of if your body is hurting treat yourself the same way as you would have done before you'd had uh, anxiety treat yourself the way you would if your partner or your child or your parents or someone you cared about had that same symptom physical symptom instead of dismissing it as oh it's just anxiety it may well be and there's no such thing as just anxiety or just stress because I've experienced back when I was 24 probably about 10 months of physical illness which was caused by stress I didn't even know that that was what caused it but I had physical, I was physically ill in my stomach I was bleeding I was all kinds of stuff and it was down to stress so stress can be the cause of physical complaints physical conditions which is why someone with a heart condition is told to try and relax more is told to not get stressed someone with hypertension high blood pressure someone with whatever their condition may be pretty much any physical condition the doctor would say try and relax more which can be something that we all can benefit from relaxing more and it's not just listening to me or you know I do quite a few other different podcasts relaxation sleep sessions things like that it's also looking after yourself and treating yourself kindly so instead of calling yourself names like a hypochondriac or or anything like that just being gentle being, I mean, I'm talking really gentle the same way as if you went into a hospital ward you wouldn't go in there and start shouting you wouldn't go and start swearing at the patients you wouldn't start uh, judging them be gentle you'd be kind you'd be calm and isn't that kind of the way that you can start being towards yourself now more importantly when perhaps we're not feeling too good that is even more important the time to be so gentle so calm and loving towards yourself so if you don't have it already create that bedside manner 
for yourself that you need for you. Because you're with yourself 24 hours a day, your entire life, and nobody else ever can compete with that. No one will ever know you the way that you know you. Which means, surely, you need to be the kindest person to you. You're the person who loves you more than anybody else will or can. Because you need yourself more than you ever need anybody else. Because you need yourself your whole life. You're traveling you're on a journey, we're on a journey and we're our only companion that travels right from the start and we'll have people come along, friends family but we're the only person, you're the only person that's with you every second of every day, your entire life We need to get on with ourselves, don't we? It seems like it's not, not even a, a, it's not a should, or a could, or a want to. It's a, it's got to be a must. It's got to be a, you know, very strong, definite must be kind and look after yourself emotionally be there for yourself and this may sound all flippy floppy to some people but I think it really makes a lot of sense. And saying it out loud, I think it makes even more sense to me. Because I really believe this. And I want to do this more for myself. I genuinely want to spend more time being gentle and kind with me. So I'm doing this with you. My intention is to to kind of travel on this journey alongside you, even though it's from a distance and it's you know it's just my voice that you're listening to but the intention real intention is there and you can hear that in my voice I generally generally genuinely genuinely want to ease The suffering, that stress and anxiety and panic has brought to your life in the past. So that you don't need to experience or re-experience any of that stuff to that level ever again. And it's not about getting rid of stress altogether. We need a degree of stress in order to function. Just a general alertness 
but I think we should, you know, that's kind of the standard psychological view. Is we need a certain amount of stress. I think they should rename it. I don't think it's stress. I don't think stress is the right word. I think stress is to people that like me, people you may agree with this stress for people that have gone through uh, extreme anxiety, panic and stress to those people, to those of us stress is a dirty word it's it's not a it's not a nice word it's not a a word that we perhaps think fondly of for good reason so maybe we can have our own word for that physical experience that is required to feel alert to be awake to be able to function under pressure at times because the outside world continues what we do here is we work on the inside we work on how you feel inside which changes how you experience the outside emotionally so that those things that happen outside in the environment work, relationships, family, school whatever it may be they don't have the same effect that maybe they used to they don't have that ability uh, that triggering ability that perhaps we used to give them credit for it's almost like we were given permission for the environment to do whatever it wanted to do and to just push our buttons whenever it wanted to so when you take those buttons away in the same way as if you've if you've got a toddler in your house you may not have children but pretty much everybody has seen a small child when they first start running around and they will grab at everything try and get anything that they can get hold of so you have to you have to sort of make your house safe it might involve covering up plugs it might involve making sure that uh, there's nothing dangerous that they can get hold of making sure there's no cups of hot coffee or tea at their level which they can grab so it's about child proofing your house or that room because I know some people that have a gate so the child can't get up the stairs child proofing the stairs So maybe we can childproof ourselves or environment proof ourselves. You think of the environment as being this little toddler and just grabbing and pushing the buttons that were there before which would maybe trigger stress, trigger anxiety, trigger maybe anger and other emotions that, you know, really didn't lead to a peaceful mind. 
and kind of left us feeling like we were out of control and being as if given the power away to the environment given the power away to others blaming other f- everything else on other outside things being reactive to outside situations but then when you child proof yourself or environment proof yourself you take away those buttons cover them up hide them paint over them remove them completely so that outside sources people the environment being on a bus travelling going to work being at work being at school being told off by your boss having a difficult conversation with your loved ones whatever it might be that those buttons can't just be pressed by outside sources they can't be pressed by other people so you're child proofing yourself your environment proofing yourself you're protecting yourself from the environment just doing whatever it wants to do by not being reactive by actually taking back your control and realising that you don't have to react you can choose to but that's your choice and if you choose to react it's no longer reacting it's responding which is similar but very different So as far as it goes with the hypochondria, my suggestion is go easy on yourself if that's how you feel about yourself or if that's how you used to feel. And regardless of what level of anxiety, stress you may have experienced, if there's a physical issue, if you've got physical pain somewhere, treat yourself the way you would have treated yourself before, do what you would have done before, so if you would have gone to the doctor before, go to the doctor, get yourself checked out, make sure that you're okay, that's part of being kind to yourself, that's a big part of loving yourself taking care of yourself and giving yourself labels like hypochondriac is the opposite to being kind to yourself it also reduces worry reduces stress and anxiety and when that reduces the way you feel physically will improve it's kind of got no choice but to improve because the way you think affects the way that you feel So I hope that this has been mildly useful and I will speak to you again very soon. Take care, 
Be kind to yourself. Lots of love.